Hi, welcome to Archival Adventures. Uh, I'm your host, Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Um, <laughs> hi, Key Squared. Hi, Lord Portico. Uh, welcome everybody in. Um, Today on Archival Adventures, we will be starting a month of exploration of the topic of backyard grilling or outdoor grilling uh, through the Rare Books Collection. So I have an assortment of books that we will be looking through on Wednesdays for the rest of July. A um, couple things uh, that I typically do announcement-wise at the beginning, I'm going to go ahead and do those again. Um, I want to acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live here at Virginia Tech and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. I want to pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation at any point from 1774 to 1865. The Preston family uh, enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Uh, further, I want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land, and acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons to the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So, today's topic, as I said, is uh, we're going to be looking at backyard grilling. Um, if you're new or didn't already know, uh, Virginia Tech, our special collections, um, we have a quite extensive uh, food history collection. And so I decided to kind of dive into that, see what I could find. Um, we don't have any, like, manuscript collections that deal particularly with this uh, topic, but we do have quite a lot of cookbooks that come from the Rare Books collection that deal s with grilling. Uh, so we're going to explore them and kind of see the evolution of grilling over time. I pulled a bunch of books and have them organized in chronological order from publication date. So um, that is how we're going to go about exploring this. Uh, I did find a short little primer that I'm going to read uh, before we dive into the books, uh, just to give us all a little bit of history here. Um, so this is a, an item from the Smithsonian, the National Museum of American History, uh, titled Backyard Cookout. Um, so after World War II, many newly afflu affluent Americans had the means and desire to travel. Some visited the Pacific Islands and Southeast Asia, where many more flocked to Mexico, uh, California, Hawaii, Florida, and the Caribbean. People developed a taste for casual living and the distinctive local foods and drink. Returning home, they recreated these experiences in their new suburban backyards, with patios, tropical drinks, and the grill, where they cooked meals craved by a post-war meat-mad America. The outdoor patio grill created a new kind of space for American families. It associated food with recreation and relaxation. It also defined a special role for men in meal preparation. While they manned the grill to cook the meat for the main course, women worked primarily in the kitchen to make the side dishes. By the late 1950s, American manufacturers and retailers were promoting new tools, clothes, furniture, and serving ware to go along with grilled meats on the patio. So that is a little bit of information about the um, general history of what would be the tradition of the American Backyard Cookout. Key squared, um, yes, <laughs> definitely uh, the, the mentions of gender there are, are very Americanized interpretations of gender roles. Um, they probably would have been prevailing at the time that backyard grilling was becoming popular. So that's likely how things were marketed um, by American manufacturers. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you know, outdoor cooking has been a thing ever since we started uh, cooking meats over fires 
um, as a species. But the specific cultural phenomenon in America that is the backyard grill, uh, the backyard cookout, and that has, it, it has evolved over time. It sort of started with the tradition of camping um, and cooking while out in camping in the wilderness. Um, and so our first works, I believe the first one I have is from like 1874 or something, um, deals with cooking while camping out. Um, and then after World War II, when suburbs started popping up all over America, um, people suddenly had backyards and uh, there was this new culture developing around inviting people over and having a cookout in your backyard. And so um, that whole idea of outdoor cooking at home um, as a social activity sort of grew from that and then has evolved over time to include things like tailgating before sporting events and uh, other aspects like that. So we're going to explore kind of what that looks like through cookbooks uh, over the next couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, Lord Portico, it's, it's absolutely a um, post-war development that grew along with the American suburban community. Um, when people came back from the war, a lot of like the cookie cutter housing developments sprang up because m people came home from war, came home from overseas and they wanted their piece of the American dream. They wanted that house that they had always been told they could have. And so all these communities started going up everywhere with cookie cutter houses because you build to one plan, you can build lots of houses. Um, and they all had their plot of land with the, the backyard and they, the idea of the American family with mom and dad and two and a half kids uh, in a single family home with a backyard and a dog that grew up in post-war America, post-World War II America. And, and along with it grew this tradition of backyard grilling. So, we're gonna start, I'm, I'm gonna switch over and, and we can start looking at some of these um, items that I've pulled. All right. So the first one that I have here is a book called Camp Cookery, How to Live in Camp by M. Parloa. Hi Melba, thank you for the 100 grill bits. Um, um, so this item, I'm trying to find the date, uh, published in 1878. Um, so this is predating the period that I just defined as the kind of the start of the cultural phenomenon, but this is kind of where it grows out of. This is um, outdoor cooking in camping, and, and so that's where we're gonna start. This is the oldest one that I pulled. Um, little blackened bits that you have to scrub off. Yes, yes, I think that would be grill bits. Um, so, this book is titled Camp Cookery, and cookery is another term just for cooking. Uh, it happens to be the term that libraries still use to classify cookbooks. So if you're looking for cookbooks, if you're looking for cooking, um, it helps to use the term cookery that you may have never heard before. Um, but uh, so this is How to Live in Camp by Miss M. Parola, lecturer on science of cooking and author of Appledore Cookbook, etc. All right. <laughs> and it starts with outfits. I mean, you can't cook outside if you're not dressed properly, right? Uh, <laughs> outfits for camping and hints for comfort. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing is selection of a tent, which can be hired of any of the sail makers for any length of time and at a reasonable price. For a party of seven or eight, an eight-foot wall tent is the best. 
dig a trench around the outside to avoid nocturnal baptism the first time it rains. Rubber blankets on the ground. So, some basic instructions on how to camp. Um, the next important thing is the stove. The top of a common cooking stove with covers and stove pipe to fit, which can be bought at any junk shop for a trifle, serves very well in dry weather. Dig out a place in the side of a bank the size and shape of the stove top, about two feet deep, and line three sides with brick or stones with the front open. Regulate the draft by placing something in front for a blower. The Lexington Camping Stove, which is the neatest, the most compact, and convenient thing of the kind I ever saw, gotten up by the Lexington Botanical Club for their own use, is just the article for camp. It is a box stove made of sheet iron, light and quickly set up or taken down. It fits in a wooden chest, which is 30 inches long, 16 and a half deep, and 15 broad. Into the stove fits a large water tank. And into the tank and one end of the stove fit all the utensils for cooking and serving. When the stove is set up, the chest answers for a closet for, uh, when the stove is set up, the chest answers for a closet for stores and also for a seat. This outfit is not prepared for the market by theorists who only guess at the wants of a camper, but has been studied out by the gentlemen and ladies who every year spend months in the mountains and who try to have all the comforts and conveniences possible, and yet to have very little baggage to transport from place to place. So essentially an 1870s glamping experience. <laughs> uh, Maria Parola, good place to start. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you approve, Kira. Uh, product placement, exactly, Lord Portico. <laughs> Some of the women cookbook authors of the late 19th and early 20th centuries were pros at product placement. I just love, like, this whole paragraph is an advertisement for this particular stove. Um, and it makes it sound like the most luxurious camping experience ever. This is, this is 1870s glamping for sure. <laughs> Hashtag not sponsored. Yeah, we are not sponsored by the Lexington Botanical Club. Um, we do not receive any proceeds for their sales of the Lexington camping stove. <laughs> um, let's see. Kerosene oil stoves are sometimes preferable for they are easily transported and can be used in wet or dry weather. The Boston Gem, made by Francis Morandi, number 102 Union Street, I find, after a thorough trial, works to a charm. The oven baking as well as my stove oven. The broiler is so made that there is no difficulty in broiling with it. When in the woods, if possible, I would, l I would have a good bed of coals for broiling. In regard to cooking utensils, coffee and teapots should not have spouts, but lips. And the lips should be riveted on. It is foolish for a party going any distance to try to carry crockery. Have tin plates and cups made, and they will last you for all your camping life. They can be kept clean by occasionally scouring them with sand on, if on the beach, and with ashes if in the mountains, or what is still better, with sapolio. Sapolio? I'm not sure what this is. Uh, which rub on a cloth and then rub the tin with the cloth. Four or six cakes of this will give you much comfort and neatness. If you can carry a farina kettle with you, and you would use it with care, it will be almost invaluable to you, as by that means you can always be sure that your oatmeal, hominy, rice, etc. will always be cooked without burning. Always be sure that there is water enough in the bottom, in the bottom kettle. Okay, what is Sapolio? It, I'm wondering, is this a brand name? Sapolio was a brand of soap noted for its advertising 
led by Artemis Ward from 1883 to 1908. Interesting that uh, according, now, so this is from Wikipedia, but according to Wikipedia, oh, oh, no, it was just led by him from 83 to 90, uh, to, to 08. So the brand, I don't know when it officially started. The sales force included King Camp Gillette, who went on to create Gillette Safety Razors. Time Magazine, Time Magazine described Sapolio as probably the world's best advertised product in its heyday. Manufactured by Enoch Morgan's Sons Company from 1869 and named for the family doctor. Interesting. So. That is definitely more product placement. It was a, a soap brand. <laughs> um, clothing, soap, provisions. First launched in 1869. <laughs> um, ooh. Provisions for camp life will depend much upon the locality and the requirements of the party. The following suggestions, however, may be serviceable in making an outfit. When it can be obtained, take Hecker's prepared flour, wheat, rye, Indian, or graham. From this, you will always be sure of good bread and griddle cakes, salt pork, smoked ham, bologna sausage, eggs, dried beef, salt fish, game, fresh fish, and, fish, and fresh meat, are supposed to be obtained in the vicinity of the camp. Pilot bread, crackers, canned fruit, and vegetables where, uh, where cannot be obtained. Potatoes, beans, onions, Indian meal, molasses, sugar, salt, pepper, mustard, vinegar, butter, coffee, tea, chocolate, rice, oatmeal, baking soda, ginger spice, soap, paraffin candles, and kerosene oil. This is a lot more stuff than I have ever taken with me camping. Like, that's a, a full pantry. Uh, but I suppose not having prepackaged foods like uh, instant oatmeal or things like that to take with you, it would require more stuff. Product placement counter three, pilot bread. Was that the third one? Or Hecker's prepared flour. The wheat. Okay, so the hacker's prepared flour is three and the pilot bread is four. Essential utensils. And we, we get to recipes now, or at least discussion of cooking. And we're starting with birds, apparently. In camp life, small and large birds should be either roasted, broiled, or stewed. Pick all the feathers off, cut a slit in them, and draw them. Either wash or wipe carefully. If for roasting, the legs, uh, if for roasting, tie the legs down and place in the pan. Sprinkle with flour, cover the bottom of the pan with water, and roast. If ducks, 30 minutes, grouse and partridges the same. Small birds, about half as long. The oven must be very hot. And then you've got birds roasted in their feathers, broiled birds, stewed partridges, uh, stewed partridges or pigeons, white fricassee of chicken, brown fricassee of chicken, chicken curry, chicken salad, sauce for birds, and broiled chicken. And then we have fish with chowder. Take either a cod or haddock, skin it. Loosen the skin about the head and draw it down toward the tail when it will peel off easily. Then run your knife down the back close to the bone, which you take out. Cut your fish in small pieces and wash in cold water. Put the head on to boil about two quarts of in about two quarts of water and boil 20 minutes. For a fish weighing six pounds, pare and slice thin five good-sized potatoes and one onion. Place a layer of potatoes 
and onion in the pot, then a layer of fish, dredge in a little salt, pepper, and flour. Keep putting in alternate layers of potatoes and fish until all is used. Use about one t tablespoonful of salt, one teaspoonful of pepper, and one teacup of flour in all. I've never seen a teacup as a, measure, a measurement. <laughs> Have ready half a pound of salt pork fried brown. Oh, ab I, Portico, I am absolutely certain that she was getting paid for the advertising. <laughs> Pour this over the mixture, add about two quarts of cold water, then strain on the water in which the head has been boiled. Uh, if this is not water enough to cover, add more cold. Cover tight and boil gently 30 minutes. If not seasoned enough, add what you please. When it has boiled 20 minutes, put in six crackers, which have been soaked three minutes in cold water. If you wish to add milk and butter, you can do so about five minutes before taking it up, but for my taste, it is much nicer and more natural without either." So that chowder sounds very much like a New England style um, chowder. It's kind of a creamy style. <laughs> yeah, hashtag no judgments, hashtag make, make that money. Hi, Hannah! Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that teacup is given as a measure here. It's just I, I haven't seen it before personally. Um, then we have fried cod, broiled cod, or scrawd. Baked cod. Broiled saltfish, broiled mackerel, fried mackerel, smelts. Brook trout, eels fried, baked eels, broiled halibut, fried halibut, uh, broiled halibut again, oh, boiled halibut, fried halibut, broiled halibut, smoked halibut, fried salmon, broiled salmon, salmon trout, and shad and haddock. The fish section uh, seems to have quite a bit more variety than the birds section. <laughs> Lack of standardized measurements. Yeah, uh, if anybody's ever tried to actually cook from an old recipe, it can be interesting. <clears throat> Shellfish. There's instructions here for a clam bake for a party of from 10 to 20 persons. Um, clam bakes, of course, continued, at least especially in New England, um, well into the, like, the 1960s. I mean, there's a Elvis song that gets paired with, is it a movie about a clam bake? I don't know. There's something to do with Elvis and a movie and clam bake and clam bakes stick with the culture. That's all I'm going for there. <laughs> clam chowder, clam boil, clam fritters, scalloped oysters. More fish recipes for camping makes... That is true, Hannah. Um, the fact that like, that people go fishing when they go camping. So a lot of fish recipes would make sense. Still using the king's measures in a kingless land. I mean, we use them to, to this day. <laughs> we get in up through lobsters, eggs, poached, scrambled, and omelets, meats, fried salt pork, Salt pork makes sense since salt pork would be something that you could carry with you. You could pre-pack it and take it along and it won't spoil. Um, you've got fried ham, broiled ham, ham and eggs, breakfast bacon, beef steak smothered in onions, broiled beef steak. So far nothing on here that really resembles what we would expect from like a backyard style cookout, like a hamburger or hot dogs or something like that. Um, oh, Kira, have a good meeting. Um, I will go back and read it out to you if you want, Hannah. I read the, um, the fish chowder, but I can find the clam chowder recipe and, and we can look at it. Uh, various vegetable recipes, potatoes warmed with pork. <laughs> 
So far, I have not come across a salad recipe, Portico. String beans, green peas, boiled rice, boiled turnips, boiled macaroni, mock bisque soup. Noted, very nice. <laughs> Stew one can of tomatoes, one quart can. While the tomatoes are stewing, put three pints of milk on to boil, setting the basin in which the milk is is into another of hot water. When the milk comes to a boil, stir in a tablespoonful of flour, which has been thoroughly mixed with a little cold milk. Let this boil 10 minutes and then add butter the size of an egg, salt, and pepper to taste. The tomatoes, which were put on at the same time with the milk, are now ready to strain into the mixture. Just before straining, stir a pinch of uh, saleratus into the tomatoes and remove to remove the acidity, serve immediately. I am not familiar with saleratus. Saleratus, sodium bicarbonate, also, or sometimes potassium bicarbonate. Uh, it is the main ingredient in baking powder. Interesting. That was a mock then we've got different bread. Uh, these are like oat cakes and corn cakes and whatnot. Fried mush. Sounds real appetizing, doesn't it? Into two quarts of boiling water, stir one tablespoonful of salt and one cup of flour mixed with one quart of Indian meal. Uh, it may take a little more than a quart of meal to make it stiff enough. Beat it well or it will be lumpy. Boil gently two hours and then turn into dish, uh, sorry, and then turn into dishes which have been dipped in cold water and set away to cool. Pans in which you bake loaves of bread are the best to cool it in as it then makes handsome slices. In the morning, cut into slices an inch thick and fry brown in pork fat. Serve slices of fried pork with it. You can cook enough at one time for several breakfasts. If you do not wish to fry the mush, do not use the flour and do not make quite so stiff. Okay, and this... I was about to look that up, Hannah. <laughs> Yeah, it's essentially cornmeal. <clears throat> so, so this would be like a, a cornbread or something like that. It could be fried grits. Um, but yeah, the Indian meal that is mentioned here is cornmeal. Spider cakes? Heat the fry pan hot, also a cover for it. While heating, mix with one pint of Hecker's, Hecker's prepared flour, product placement again, uh, half a pint of milk or water, grease the hot pan with pork, lard, or butter, and pour half the mixture into it. Make smooth with the spoon, cover and cook four minutes, turn the cake and cook four minutes longer. Take up, grease the pan again, and put in the remainder of the mixture, which cook as before. I have no idea why that's called spider cake. Like, seriously, what about that makes it a spider cake? I, I don't understand. Flour, milk, grease, but you grease the pan and you pour the, it's literally just a mixture of flour and milk together. You pour it into, into a greased pan and cover it and cook for four minutes. Then you turn it over and cook for four minutes. And that's it. It's like a flour 
and milk pancake that is partly steamed. I don't understand why it's called a spider cake. <laughs> I suppose I would have to try making it to figure out. Milk toast, not to be confused with milk toast. Uh, <laughs> this is M-I-L-K space T-O-A-S-T, -T, not M-I-L-Q-U-E-T-O-A-S-T. Thank you, Key Squared. Spider is a type of iron skillet. And then we get puddings, which in this case is not referring to pudding in the way that Americans refer to pudding, even though I believe this was published in America. Let me see. This is, I believe, from New York. Nope, Boston. Um, but here in 1870s, this chapter titled Puddings is just referring to desserts. So it's more the British use of the term pudding. Um, ooh, an apple dowdy. If you're unfamiliar with an apple dowdy, also probably would be referred to as an apple pan dowdy today. It would be similar to like an apple pie. Pair and quarter about one dozen good tart apples. Put them in a kettle with one cup of molasses, a small piece of butter, and one pint of hot water. Set this on the fire and let it come to a boil. And when it is heating, make a paste with one pint of prepared flour and one half a pint of milk. Roll this out large enough to cover the apple, put it, put it into the kettle, cover tight, and boil gently 20 minutes. So a, a dowdy is similar to a pie, except it's in an iron skillet, um, and there's no bottom crust. Uh, so in this book, puddings equals desserts, not, not just cakes or puddings the way that we would think of them. They do have cornstarch pudding, which would just be a, a pudding thickened with cornstarch and most likely flavored with vanilla, which is definitely the first pudding I ever learned to make. Uh, we have a whole separate chapter for cakes, sauces and dressings, I have yet to see a salad mentioned, but there are salad dressings in here. Um, a dowdy is similar to a crumble or a crisp, except it uses a pie crust like top crust. So um, a crumble or a crisp, so a crumble um, generally has a flour-based mixture that's sprinkled on top and that makes the top crust. Uh, a crisp is generally like rolled oats instead of flour. Um, similar mixture, but substituting out rolled oats for flour uh, and then sprinkled on top to make the top crust. A dowdy, um, which would be D-O-W-D-Y, um, is similar. Um, a crumble or a crisp can be done in like a Dutch oven or a pie, a, a pie plate. Um, there are various different vessels you could make it in. A dowdy generally would not be in a pie plate. It would just be done in an iron skillet type thing or like a, a, a Dutch oven. Um, but you fill it with the filling, there's no bottom crust, and then you put a standard like flour-based pie crust on top. Uh, so you just get the top pie crust, no bottom crust, and the filling. Um, I don't know why there's so much variation, and they're all called different things, but I find them fascinating, and, and that is one area of cooking that I'm interested in. I haven't made all of the different types, and there are so, so many different types, but yeah, there's, it gets really particular in a crumble, a crisp, and a dowdy are all almost exactly the same thing. The only difference is the type of topping that's put on. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to find that clam chowder. We're going to read that, and then we're going to move on to, I believe, 1914. All 
All right, shellfish, clam chowder. When intending to have clams in any form, get them in the shell, if possible, the day before. Place them in a tub and cover with clean water and throw into this about a quart of Indian meal, which we just learned would be cornmeal. This fattens them. When ready to use the clams, wash them thoroughly, then cover them with boiling water and let them stand 10 minutes when they will open easily. Take them from the shell, cut off the black heads, and put the bodies of the clams in a clean dish. Strain the water in which they were scalded into the kettle in which you intend to cook your chowder. To one peck of clams, allow three quarts of water. Let the water come to a boil, then thicken it with half a cup of flour, which has been mixed up with cold water, seasoned with pepper and salt. Add the clams and a tablespoonful of butter, then uh, let it boil 10 minutes. A few minutes before dishing, drop in three or four broken crackers. So that uh, is literally just the clams cooked in water and thickened with not very much flour at all. The, there is a second clam chowder recipe here. For one peck of clams, take six good-sized potatoes, pared and sliced thin, half an onion uh, cut into pieces an inch square. Fry quarter of a pound of pork to a nice brown. Place the pork and gravy, the potatoes and onions, in your kettle. Shake over the whole one tablespoonful of salt, two teaspoonsful of pepper, and half a cup of flour. Strain over this four quarts of the water in which you scalded the clams. Place on the fire and boil 15 minutes, then add the clams and four split crackers. Boil 10 minutes longer and serve. So they're both thickened with crackers and flour. Uh, the difference is that the second recipe includes potatoes, onions, and pork. Um, where the first one is, you just take the clams, you boil them, you add a little bit of flour and some salt and pepper, and that's it. Uh, I guess there's a little bit of butter uh, as well. Neither one is like the chowder that you have every New Year's. So the number two sounds more like a, a New England style. Um, neither one is like the Manhattan style, which is more of a tomato-based chowder. Um, but I guess there's multiple different ver possible versions of chowders. The New England style and the Manhattan style are the two that I'm most familiar with, um, where the New, in New England style tends to be cream-based and the Manhattan style is more of like a tomato broth. Um, all right. So the next book that I have is called Camp Kirkery by Horace uh, Kephart. And it has a lovely little illustration on the cover here of a frying pan uh, with some steam coming off of it. Um, and this is from 1910. So a little over a decade from the last one that we looked at. Uh, I'm uncertain the f name of who this is to. Miriam D. Babcock or something like that. I'm not sure. The, it, I don't think it's Babcock, but I can't make out what the last name is. From a campfire girl. All right. So this is by Horace Kephart. Author of Camping and Woodcraft, The Hunting Rifle, etc. You don't do New England or Manhattan style, but probably closer to New England style. Ooh, this one has illustrations uh, with pen drawings of camp utensils, outfits, etc. 
from the Outing Publishing Company of New York. Dedication, dedication to Mistress Bob, who taught me some clever expedients of backwoods cookery that are lost arts wherever the old forest has been leveled. So this appears to be published by a publishing company in London. Well, no. The outing pub this is published in New York, but the copyright is London. <laughs> Boscock is a possibility he key squared. It's not a name I'm familiar with, which is probably why I didn't make the connection, but uh, that seems very, very possible. Forward. The less a man carries in his pack, the more he must carry in his head. A camper cannot go by recipe alone. It is best for him to carry sound general principles in his head and recipes in his pocket. The simpler the outfit, the more skill it takes to manage it and the more pleasure one gets in his achievements. So we get the, an actual table of contents. Uh, provisions, utensils, fires, dressing and keeping game and fish, meat, game, fish and shellfish, cured meats, bread, stuffs and cereals, vegetables, soups, beverages and desserts, and an appendix. What doesn't sound like it had good sponsorships? Oh, the dedication or the, the forward? So far, I haven't found any product placement. A table for ready reference in choosing what to cook. Pack light, you don't need stuff. That, yes, yes, Portico. Uh, I imagine if there had been lots of product placement, they would have said, pack light in this lovely backpack. <laughs> All recipes in this book are here grouped under quick, medium, or slow. According to the time they take, everything under quick can be prepared in less than 25 minutes, and so especially suitable for breakfast or luncheon. The table also shows at a glance what recipes call for milk, butter, or eggs, and what do not. The following abbreviations are used. E, eggs required, whole or desiccated. B, butter required, M, milk required, may be evaporated or powdered. E, star, eggs desirable, but may be omitted. B, star, butter desirable, but other fat may be substituted. M, star, uh, I don't know why I'm saying star, it's an asterisk, but anyway. Milk desirable, but water may be substituted. Uh, the paragraph symbol, uh, made over from previously boiled material. I don't know what that symbol is called, and... It's called a pilcrow! So the, the pilcrow means made over from previously boiled material. Had it been an octothorpe, I would have known the name of it. Otherwise, uh, modernly known as a hashtag. Um, anyway, <laughs> then we get a list of quick recipes. Someone has dog-eared the, um, the start of the table here. Medium recipes, slow recipes. So medium recipes are 25 to 45 minutes and slow recipes take more than 45 minutes to make. So they go into how to choose what to bring with you. I don't see any product placement, so he's definitely not doing as well as the woman who did the, the, the previous book. <clears throat> um, we can skip over the provisions. We're less interested in 
what to take with you camping than we are in some of the recipes and utensils. Because <clears throat> the recipes and utensils are what's going to evolve into backyard cooking. A party going into fixed camp within wagon call of the railroad can carry a sheet steel stove. A good pattern is the Klondike stove shown in the illustration. Its best feature is the size of the firebox, which takes in wood 28 inches long and thick enough to keep an all-night fire. Hi, Vampire Vaxel Dan, how are you? Uh, brain, brain, brain. I lost my place. Oh, the stove being closed, airtight. The top of the Klondike, 14 by 30 inches, is free for utensils. The oven above it takes a 10 by 14 pan for baking or roasting. Oven length, legs and pipes, ugh. oven legs and pipes stow inside the body of the stove, leaving space for a 12 by 13 by 9 and a half inch galvanized box that holds cooking utensils for four persons and can be used in camp as a dish pan or as a vermin-proof box for provisions. When packed for transportation, the stove measures 30 by 14 by 12 inches and weighs 29 pounds. So I'm unclear whether the Klondike stove is product placement or just referring to a style of stove. I have a feeling it's actually product placement because if we move to the next page, uh, we have mention of a lighter grate is Sackett's Camp Broiler, which sounds like another product. So I think we've got two product placements here. How did you even get that to camp? Um, so camping in the late 19th century and early 20th century would have involved porters to carry things for you. Would have involved driving your vehicle to where you were going to set up camp or um, horses or mules to carry things. So you would not have been worried about the weight of things. Like you're gonna take a cast iron uh, skillet with you. You're gonna take a fire pit with you instead of just piling up some stones and putting a fire in, in the middle of that the way that we would today. Today we're expecting like oh, we're gonna go hiking for a bit and we're gonna carry everything on our back so we want everything as light as possible. That wasn't how they approached it. They would literally load up a couple of horses, some mules or servants and have them carry stuff for them. So they didn't care how much it weighed. Yeah, old timey glamping is right. <laughs> Ideally, all is well. Uh, Vampire Vaxel Dan, I hope it's well for you. I Things have been, um, it, it's been an okay day for me, I guess. Um, it's not been the best week, but I'm getting through it. Also, hi, Simsilica. Um... So we have a Sackett's broiler here, which appears to just be a set of legs to put your pans on above the fire. A gem folding grate. Sam Gamgee's backpack comes from a long tradition. Oh, I'm sorry, Vaxel Dan. Well, I hope things get better for you. A cooking kit for six. It's nice to have some illustrations. All of these look very familiar in form uh, to other like camping utensils that I am familiar with. So if you look here, in this figure, we've got a coffee a coffee boiler and a miner's coffee pot, um, both of which seem very familiar in form to the types of um, utensils that we would take camping today. Uh, three is a percolator. We may not have that today. Uh, four is a miner's cup, which definitely seems familiar to the type of like camping cup that. Um, 
that I'm used to from when I was camping in like the 80s. Um, a, number five is a baker. I've never seen a utensil quite like that for camping. Uh, six is a water bucket. Seven is a reflector, which I'm not familiar with either of those, but eight is a frying pan and it has a removable handle that is hollow in the center. Um, and this is definitely a frying pan format that I have encountered in reality in my life. Yes, many lovely products to furnish your Adirondack Lodge. Um, looks like there's some instruction on how to set up fires. Dressing and keeping game and fish. Uh, gonna kind of skip over part of that because it's actually talking about how to break down animals and I don't really want to feature that um, too much. This is true, Vampire Vaxel Dan. Yes, quotes from this book out of context could be interesting. Also, I'm very curious about who Mistress Bob is. The dedication to Mistress Bob. I want to know more about Mistress Bob. Um, the main secrets of good meals in camp are to have a proper fire, good materials, and then to imprison in each dish at the outset its natural juice and characteristic flavor. To season fresh camp dishes as a French chef would is a blunder of the first magnitude. The raw materials used in city cuisine are often of inferior quality from keeping in cold storage or with chemical preservatives, so their insipidity must be corrected by spices, herbs, and sauces to make them eatable. Wow, insipidity is a very strong word. In cheap restaurants and boarding houses where the chef's skill is lacking, all things taste alike, from having been penned up together in a refrigerator and cooked in a fetid atmosphere. In my chapter on provisions, I advised that a few condiments be taken along, but these are mostly for seasoning leftovers or for desserts, not for fresh meat, unless we have but one kind to the surfeiting point. In the woods, our fish is freshly caught, our game has hung out of doors, and the water and air used in cooking, most important factors, are sweet and pure. Such viands, no, such viands need no masking. The only seasoning required is with pepper and salt to be used sparingly and not added, except in soups and stews, until the dish is nearly or quite done. Remember this, salt draws the juices. <laughs> um, definitely some vocabulary here that we would not find in common usage today. Um, we definitely don't use the word surfeit very much. Uh, we don't use viands very often. Um, <laughs> yes, this lexicon is magnificent. Uh, Ooh, frying. Do not fry. Do not try to fry over a flaming fire or a deep bed of coals. The grease would likely burn and catch a flame. Rake a thin layer of coals out in front of the fire, or for a quick meal, make your fire of sma small dry sticks, no thicker than your finger. Boil water for your coffee over the flame, and then fry over the quickly formed coals. If you have a deep pan and plenty of frying fat, it is much the best to immerse the material completely in boiling grease as donuts are fried. Let the fat boil until little jets of smoke arise, being careful not to burn the grease. When fat begins to smoke continuously, it is decomposing and will impart an acrid taste. When a breadcrumb dropped in will, will be crisp when taken out, the fat is of the right temperature. Then quickly drop in small pieces of the material one at a time so as not to check the heat. Turn them once while cooking. Remove when done and drop them a moment on coarse paper to absorb surplus grease or hang them over a row of small sticks so they can drain. Then season. 
The fry will be crisp and dry enough to handle without soiling the fingers. This is the way for small fish. Interesting. I have never considered frying while camping. And I don't know that I would consider it because most of the time when I've gone camping, at least any time recently, it's been very, very hot and very, very dry and I don't want to light a fire anyway. But anyway, <laughs> you've never had to imprison flavor. <laughs> I agree. It's wonderful perspicacity. Let's see, what else do we have here? Boiling, stewing, steaming. Like, they were willing to go to a lot of work. Oh. Yeah, we're going to skip over the list of the different pieces of deer that can be cooked there. Um, some recipe or instructions on... Roasting a wild goose! That just seems like a ton of work, but I guess if you're counting on hunting for meat while you're camping, you cook whatever you can find. But, uh, a few decades later, about 40 years later than when this book was published, when people are starting to try and cook in their backyards, they could have looked back to books like this for inspiration as to what they could cook on their brand new backyard grills and how to go about doing it. Butter sauce, white sauce. Interesting. He's he's got a freaking recipe in here for frog legs. He was belittling French cuisine a few chapters before, and here he's got a recipe for frog legs. <laughs> he's he's got. Um, where was it? Butter sauce and cream sauce. He's. Oh, butter sauce and white sauce. Like, put the butter in a cold pan and rub it into the flour, salt, and pepper, beating well. Then pour on a scant half pint boiling water. Cook two minutes. Like, he's got French cuisine in his recipes, but he was belittling French cuisine. Cured meats. Interesting, we get to the recipes and there's no more illustrations. All of the illustrations were about the equipment at the beginning. I'm just looking to see. Plain flapjacks. One quart of flour, one teaspoonful of salt, two teaspoonfuls of sugar, and four of molasses. Or, sorry, or four of molasses two level tablespoonfuls of baking powder. Rub in, so by 1910, we've got baking powder as just an ingredient on its own. Uh, food doesn't pay sponsorships and engravings cost extra. I guess you're probably right. Rub in dry two heaped tablespoonfuls of grease. If you have no grease, do without. Make a smooth batter with cold milk best or water Thin enough to pour from a spoon, but not too thin or it will take all day to bake enough for the party. Stir well to smooth out lumps. Set frying pan level over thin bed of coals. Get it quite hot and grease with a piece of pork in split end of stick. Pan must be hot enough to make batter sizzle as it touches and it should be polished. Pour from end of a big spoon successively enough batter to fill pan within one half inch of rim. Uh, when cake is full of bubbles and edges have stiffened, shuffle pan to make sure that cake is free below and stiff enough to flip. Then hold pan slanting in front of and away from you. Go through preliminary motion of flapping once or twice to get the swing. Then flip boldly so cake will turn a somersault in the air and catch it upside down. Beginners generally lack the nerve to toss high enough. 
grease pan anew and stir batter every time before pouring. This is the universal pancake that Nesmuk derided. Much better and wholesomer are egg pancakes, snow pancakes. Wait, what? Okay, egg pancakes made same as above, excepting that you add two eggs or their equivalent in, des in desiccated egg. But snow pancakes, instead of eggs, use four tablespoonfuls of freshly fallen snow. Make the batter rather thick and add some clean, dry snow to each pancake before putting it in the pan. Isn't that just adding more water? I have never heard of these snow pancakes. All right. <laughs> um, this is true Simsilica, but uh, later we will have actual like recipe books that are more modern recipe books that won't be showing things like that. But um, but yeah, at, in 1910, if they had illustrations of the food, they would definitely be showing um, how to cut up your fish. So the next one I have here is called Camping and, Cook, uh, Camping and Camp Cooking. Um, it's actually brand new. It hasn't even been cataloged yet, which is why it has this yellow slip of paper in it. Because um, it's waiting to be cataloged. It is from 1909. So actually a year before the last one that we were looking at. Oh, sorry, no, copyright 1909. Um, it was published in 1914. Uh, in the front, we have uh, written in property of Louis M. Uh, Taxiarchus, M.D., Philohela Run, Buxton Center, Maine, 1966. Um, so I know nothing about that person. Uh, we recently acquired this book. This is by Frank Bates um, Matasiso, author of Game Birds of North America, Stories of Lake, Field, and Forest, How to Make Old Orchards Profitable, etc. New and revised edition. So originally published in 1909, this edition is from 1914. To my friend Frank W. Brett, MD, the companion of many camps and the friend of many days, this little book is affectionately dedicated by the author. In laying this new edition of Camping and Camp Cooking before the reading public, it becomes my duty, the most pleasant that falls to the lot of a writer, to express my thanks for the kind reception of the little book. That it has been a success is proven by the kind words of practical people. Hence, but little change has been made in the body of the book, but an appendix has been added on uh, the care of the health, the reason for which will be found therein expressed. Interesting. So we, we will want to look at the appendix at some point. Uh, so discussing camping as vacation time. Camping outfit. <laughs> A camping outfit should be light and compact with all unnecessary articles eliminated and all needful ones included. That reads a little funny, but it is the gist of the whole question and the biggest question that was ever presented to a man. That is, you will think so when you are trying to get a 100 pound outfit over a, swamp, uh, over a swampy carry on a rainy day and while laying up over a spell of wet weather afterward. In the first place, you wonder why you brought so much truck and in the second place, why you did not bring many other things. So it seems needless to say that the composition of an outfit depends to some extent on the individual taste of the camper and more upon the character of the trip. No sane man would carry the amount of duffel on a walking trip that he would if he went with a team or if he was to be in a permanent camp during the whole of his trip. 
Hence, I propose to classify them in two sorts, walking trips and permanent camps. But before I set down the list of impedimenta, I want to moralize a little. Of course he wants to moralize a little. I confess that I enjoy the comforts of life and as many of the luxuries as my purse or circumstances will allow, and while I have enjoyed many tramps with nothing but what I could easily carry in my knapsack, I enjoy one much better if I have more conveniences and very few vacationists care to rough it. Too much in the short time they have for their annual trips and there is no need to do so. One of the finest woodsmen and grandest of men, Nesmuk, has written a book which is a criterion for the man who can stand that kind of trip. But what sort of vacation do you suppose a city clerk would have if he patter patterned his trip after this model? The question was not needed, he simply would not try it, for the average city clerk is not so big a fool as he appears to the average county dwe or country dweller, so let it go at that. To get back on our trail again, a party would not need the same outfit in July as he would require in October, and while there is no sense in sleeping cold at night because of a lack of blankets, there is also no use for a sleeping bag for a July camping trip. And in this judgment of the actual necessities is where the average camper fails. The majority of camping parties occur in the warm season, when game birds and animals are protected by law, and there is no need for a gun. But most men will confess to feeling a greater security when there is a firearm in camp. A light revolver will serve all purposes to drive away marauding animals, or to while away a dull hour at target practice, a little, and a little practice will render it thus available. In the fall of the year, the fish rod will be replaced by the shotgun and rifle, but it is always well to have a line and a few hooks in the ditty bag. A, new, a few fish will make an acceptable change in the diet, even if a deer hangs at the tent door. <sighs> so... <laughs> Definitely uh, some analysis given. We still have that kind of standard camping frying pan as an essential. Uh, note the removable handle. <laughs> Lord Portico, what is really frightening is that 1914 camping um, brings to mind 1980s Boy Scout camping for me. Although, we took sleeping bags with us in the summer. The wall tent. We never did do wall tents like that for our general camping, because we had the bubble tents, etc., the quick, uh, quick to put up tents. But at Boy Scout camp, where the camp was up all year round and the tents were up all summer, we had wall tents. You would prefer your bow to a gun, but other than that. Yeah, I never really did any hunting. That's one thing that I did not do. A shanty tent. Um, but I definitely did a lot of camping. A dog tent, which today we would refer to as a pup tent. Uh, a lean-to. Exactly, key squared. A lot of it is is very similar to stuff that um, I'm familiar with from Boy Scout camping in the 80s and uh, early 90s. Which... I have a Boy Scout book here. We might get to it today. We might not. So if you've got enough stones, you can build yourself a, a stove, a, Mat a Matasiso stove. I'm not sure I would be doing that. Um, fish bag, cleaning fish, cleaning fish. What to do if lost? And 57 pages in, we finally get to cooking. So. Oh, this book actually is called Camping and Camp Cooking, so that makes sense, I guess. Yeah, yeah, the art 
um, from these books looks very similar and qu quite easily could have been reused for Boy Scout manuals. Uh, so again, skunk stew. We have a recipe here for skunk stew. I was in doubt whether to insert this here on account of the prejudice that some people have against this animal. Properly prepared, it is really a delicacy. When you catch a skunk, of course you kill him. If you can, before he explodes. If the odor is strong, hang the carcass over a smudge of hemlock twigs, be being careful not to scorch the fur. Skin and dress, being careful not to break the musk glands, which must be carefully removed. Put in cold water over a slow fire and boil for an hour, or as long as any fat will rise to the top. Skim off this fat and carefully preserve it in a bottle against the time when a baby has the croup, or you yourself have a sprained muscle. It is very penetrating. Throw away the water and boil the meat with a sliced onion in fresh water till the meat will slip off the bones. Add sliced potatoes and season with salt, pepper, and a very little sage or poultry dressing. Many a man has become a confirmed uh, mephit... Now that's just unfair. Mephitophagist after partaking of the above without knowing what he was eating until he had finished his meal. That word is unfair. Mephitophagist. <laughs> Skunk, skunk stew should not be inserted anywhere. <laughs> oh, I was not expecting skunk stew. There's a Webster chowder. Which is... Potato fish, basically similar to some of the other chowders that we already saw. Bean soup, pea soup, broiled steaks, fried salt pork, fried eggs on hash, fried eggs, Cape Cod succotash. What do we have? What do we have? Oh. So the appendix, I wanted to, it said it would become apparent when we reached the section why it was added. You'll stick to the quail. <laughs> uh, sickness in camp. This subject was not forgotten in the design of this little camp companion, but the danger from the administration of drugs by incompetent hands is great. And the author felt that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing and something that should be avoided. However, some of the readers have expressed opinions in the matter and requested its insertion. In the preparation of a new edition of the book, a good opportunity presented itself and a little advice is herewith offered. The author still advises that a physician be consulted, if it be possible, not only account of the danger of taking a wrong medicine or too much of a proper one, but because few people are really competent to make a proper diagnosis. <laughs> as far as you can tell from a quick Google search and n-gram check, nobody else has ever used mephitophagist in a sentence. <laughs> I mean, it is um, a particularly hard one to figure out how to say. Um, I need a sip of water real quick. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, not even a definition for the word, just that sentence. Well, mephitophagist is out there. Uh, I believe it would be... Let's 
So it would be referring to um, so the, the family of mammals that the skunk belongs to is Mephidid, uh, Mephididae. And ist, I-S-T would be like an enthusiast, uh, somebody who is particularly interested in a certain thing. So mephidophagist would be somebody who is a fan of skunks. Yeah, somebody who enjoys skunks. All right. So next we have another edition of Camp Cookery by Horace Kephart. So this was not the one that we just looked at, but the one before that. I uh, Possibly, key squared. I didn't look up that part of the word. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so it would be somebody who likes to eat skunk. Mephidophagist. So we have Camp Cookery by Horace Kephart again. Um, this edition belonged to Francis A. Ward and was published in 1923. So we've moved 13 years on from the previous one. And um, the pages are not fully cut. <laughs> The, uh, the bottom of these two pages is, has not been cut. Oh no. It doesn't appear frozen to me. Maybe if you refresh, because everything looks like it's good on my end. We have the same forward. The whole book. It's the whole book. The whole book has uncut bottoms of the pages. <laughs> well, that's going to make this an interesting excursion into a book. Because every other page is not cut. Oh, maybe it's not the entire book. Just that few things at the beginning. So honestly, I don't know what's going to be different about this edition. This is the same book that we just looked at a f little bit ago. Um, it was the 1910 book that started with the Klondike stove and the Sackett's camp broiler. And we have those again. So we have a couple different editions. I'm not going to dive into it too closely to see particularly what the differences are. Oh, you have spots in the back to write new recipes, though. And this one is a little bit bigger. This one seems more like, um, more like it was intended to be a reference work on your shelf at home than for you to take camping with you. Uh, where the others have been smaller and lighter and thinner and seemed like they could be something that you'd stick in your camping bag to take with you. Like, we went from this, so height-wise slightly bit taller, width-wise slightly bigger, and there are more pages for sure, either that or it's heavier paper. Um, 
but it definitely feels less like something that's meant to take with you and more like a reference work for you to use at home. <clears throat> the next item that we have is from 1927 called Easy Camp Cooking Recipes, Fresh Milk in Camp. And so this is from 1927. It has actual advertisements in it. We announce the new outdoor package. KLIM is pure fresh milk from which the water has been removed by the Merrill Sewell spray process. KLIM retains all of the nutritive properties of the original milk. By replacing the water, Fresh milk is provided at a moment's notice. The new two and one quarter ounce camper's tin presents KLIM ideally packed for outdoor use. Some of the advantages. The key attached easily opens the tin. The contents of the two and one quarter ounce tin provides a pint of liquid milk. No partly used tins to spill and mess up the pack. KLIM is one eighth the weight of liquid milk. KLIM keeps without ice. It will not freeze. Infants and children thrive on KLIM. KLIM can be used for drinking or cooking. KLIM guarantees a uniform safe milk supply. KLIM is milk in its most convenient form. K KLIM for home use is packed in one pound, two and a half pound, and five pound tins. If your druggist or grocer is unable to supply KLIM, we will temporarily supply you by mail. The economy in packing KLIM in the larger tins is reflected in the price. 15 cents each, $1.75 a dozen, order by mail. Merrill Sewell Company, Syracuse, New York. <laughs> Backwards milk. Yeah, who would have thought? <laughs> And they, they try to drive that home to you with the actual design of the, um, the tin itself. So the logo on the tin, the M is larger. And so it, it kind of looks like it's mirrored. So the M is larger and the K is smaller. So you kind of feel like you're supposed to read it from the M to the K. <laughs> This is not a stereotyped recipe book. It is a book designed as a guide where cooking must often be done with the primitive tools of the camp. It is written by men who have cooked for the enjoyment of themselves and friends in any and all circumstances. It is not a laboratory product, and these recipes have not been used under the conditions in which our camper reader will, or sorry, and these recipes have been used under the conditions in which our camper reader will find himself. In short, the recipes which follow are practical, not theoretical. We take this occasion to thank Mr. Morris Ackerman, Mr. Charles S. Kirstead, Mr. James Tandy Ellis, Mr. W. H. H. Chamberlain, Mr. Harry S. Fibbs, Mr. George C. Catton, Major Townsend Weldon, for their cooperation. And if you enjoy and find helpful these recipes, thank them, not us. I take that to mean these are the people who had to taste all of our tries. Um, their con contributions have not followed recipe book style. They tell a story and give you advice as they go along. We believe the tang of the outdoors is blended in these recipes. If you want a special recipe, just refer to the index. If you want general instructions, just read the book through. Uh, oh. Luigi Stephanie, thank you for confirming that I wasn't frozen over there either. And welcome. It's good to have you visiting. Um, I didn't notice right away because that chat has been so inactive. I've been focused on this chat. Um, if you couldn't tell, I'm streaming on two channels. Uh, oh, so those people actually wrote individual chapters. Interesting. Well, let's see. Oh, Morris Ackerman. Um, Axe chapter. 
So the attitude here is slightly different. They, they give a little bio of the person. Morris Ackerman, born Madison, Mo uh, Madison, Morgan County, Georgia, 1883. Cut his teeth on a muzzle loader. Picked up fishing to pass time between hunting seasons. Editor and publisher Ackerman's Sportsman's Guide, 11 years. Fish and game writer, Newspaper Enterprise Association, etc. So. But the attitude here, cutting your teeth on a muzzle loader, sounds unwise. <laughs> yeah. X chapter. I'm not much on cooking, but when it comes to the appreciative consumption of food, I average well up in the scores. I've hunted and fished with some of the most notable cooks in the whole world. Guides, most of them. But give me a hard day on the trail with the campfire at night and a woodland repast, and, and you can have your Ritz Chateau and Waldorf. Did you ever set out of a night and eat speckled trout and salmon cutlets with the barman of New Bruns or with the he-man of New Brunswick, Harry Allen? Did you ever have a help in a moose liver and stack of flapjacks in front of Louis Harlow's wigwam on the banks of Old Pescawan uh, Lake in Nova Scotia? Ever try Curly Phillips Bighorn Ram roasts up to the head of Sheep Creek? Have you? tried the shanty cooking of Ernie St. Jacques on the Gatineau or Frank Jawbone at Kipawa. Ain't it wonderful? The guy that don't know thinks that all there is to a fishing or hunting trip is how much fish or game you get. This ain't the half of it. The main thing is, how was the food? A carload of deer, moose, bear, or caribou on a hunting trip isn't near the real sport of a missed buck if the food is good. <laughs> I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, so he continues on with his introduction and then says, and don't forget to take along plenty of KLIM. KLIM is milk. Some folks say KLIM is a splendid substitute for fresh milk. I say KLIM mixed with the icy waters of the Canadian Rockies tastes better than fresh milk. It was on the Alberta-British Columbia hunt that I really became intimately acquainted with this product. To start with, the guides, Curly and Phillips, and Curly, uh, Curly Phillips and Curly Cochran, raved about the fact that you could carry so much KLIM on such a small horse. The cook, Dick, raved because the nine men in the party got the idea that he, Dick, had established some sort of dairy up there in the mountains. <laughs> I just love that it's like the introduction of him and him telling his story and talking about and he ends with an an ad for the product in the back of the cover. And this is not modern times. This isn't like a YouTuber inserting an ad uh, into their video. Uh, this is a book from 1927 that is supposed to be about cooking while camping. And I guess indeed actually it is exactly like a YouTuber inserting an ad in the middle of their video. So Charles Kirkstead, his entire section is recipes using Klim. I'm going to call it Klim. But his whole section is recipes for Klim. Or at least the beginning of it is. I mean, that, this is actually not uncommon. Um, there's a, tons and tons of blatant product placement in everything. Uh, like 1800s, 1900s, um, product placement is everywhere. So it is not a new phenomenon. George Catton. Again, Klim recipes. This whole book is actually one giant ad for dehydrated milk. <laughs> How to Select Materials for the Camp Larder by Charles S. Kirkstead. 
First, take your list and write CLIM in capital letters because CLIM should form the center around which the camp mess should be built. Make further selections from the following list. Be sure to include your camp kit one or more CLIM measures, especially exactly equal to two level tablespoons. A small flour sieve or medium ordinary wire strainer, a small road, but like <laughs> warning for concentrated lactose intolerance. Yes, uh, just wow. Like, be sure to include or first take your list and write the name of this product on there because your entire list should revolve around this product. It did. It did indeed, Hannah, say fresh milk for uh, for camping right on the cover. Oh, hi, hi, Kira. Welcome back. Yes, we have been looking at a a book that claimed to be a easy camp cooking recipes, but is in fact one giant ad for Klim. Your own recipes. Surprisingly, it does not tell you to only write recipes using Klim. Oh, it's an ad for a different product in the back. Fresh lemonade at a minute's notice. How would you like to have a cold pitcher of real lemonade in the camp or be able to make a good old fashioned lemon pie? You can have both of these whenever you want if you have some lemonade and cold water. Lemonade is the juice of fresh ripe lemons blended with some sugar and made in the same way as powdered milk. Contains no artificial color or flavor, just fresh lemon juice with the moisture taken away. If you have not tasted lemonade, we will send you a four ounce tin by mail on receipt of 25 cents. No additional charge for postage. <laughs> Eat milk on the trail. Carry a complete lunch in your pocket. Milk is the most complete food known to man, and this food is found in its ideal form for the hasty lunch in the Klim Wafer. The Klim Wafer is simply Klim powdered whole milk flavored with pure orange or lemon juice or chocolate and pressed into wafers. Send 25 cents for trial can containing 14 wafers, shipped direct if your dealer is not stocked. Klim wafers are packed one flavor or assorted flavors to the can. The brand survives? You can still get Klim today? Nestle sells powdered milk under the Klim brand. Uh, it probably is the same company, just eventually purchased by company, by company, by company, and eventually bought by Nestle. What is Klim? Klim is milk that has been pasteurized in the absence of air at 145 degrees for 30 minutes and then dehydrated, water removed, by the spray process. Pasteurization removes any disease-carrying bacteria which may be present and once the water has been removed, bacterial development stops. Thus, the principal cause of deterioration, the water is removed and the powder, properly packed, will remain fresh for months. Klim powdered whole milk is now packed by a new method in the absence of oxygen and will keep indefinitely. The aging process is reduced to a minimum and months after packing, absolutely fresh milk is obtained when the powder is mixed with water. <laughs> Bought out by Borden and then by Nestle. So I don't know about you all, I grew up with powdered milk in the pantry, and on occasion, if we ran out of milk between groceries, or like between grocery trips, we would make some milk using the powdered milk. And it does not taste anything like actual milk. It tastes water more watery than skim milk. Um, we grew up mostly drinking or using 2% milk fat milk. Um, powdered milk is not the same. <laughs> so the next one I have is called Kettles and Campfires. 
I'm trying to get at least to the Boy Scout book today, which should bring us to around 1940, which means we'll get to the actual beginning of grilling next week, or beginning of backyard grilling. So this week is mostly going to be camping stuff. Um, yeah, and then we'll actually get into like the post-war backyard grilling stuff next week. So written on the front here, somebody's got their name. It appears to be Sally B. Stickney. I'm not sure if you can really see it. It's written up in pencil. It's kind of faint. Um, Oh, but then we have it here as well. Sally B. Stickney. Kettles and Campfires. The Girl Scout Camp and Trail Cookbook. Published by Girl Scouts Incorporated, 670 Lexington Avenue, New York, New York. Powdered milk was used in your house all the time. Trying to feed a family on five, a five on one income. Yeah. Okay for baking and maybe on cereal. And, and yeah, it, it's not great for drinking. We had it, at, so I, I grew up also in a household of five, and um, we would buy a certain amount of milk uh, on each shopping run, but my mom didn't like run out to the store if we ran out of milk. We just pulled out the powdered milk and reconstituted it and used that until it was time to go grocery shopping again. Um, and yes, Portico, condensed milk and powdered milk are not the same thing. <laughs> Wait, what? The captions turned powdered milk into pattern buffers? <laughs> That's weird. Anyway. Uh, 1928, Girl Scouts, Kettles and Campfires. Why a camp cookbook? Good question. Two, favorite Girl Scout activities join forces in this little book. Cooking, an accomplishment in which a large proportion of Girl Scouts qualify yearly by earning proficiency badges, and camping, probably the most eagerly sought and hugely enjoyed of any of the opportunities that Girl Scouting offers to girls. It is quite natural then that there should be a Girl Scout camp cookbook. Camping loses much of its fun and zest unless every camper does her share in the novel experience of preparing, cooking, and eating meals out of doors. Yeah, Roaring Twenties. This book is more than 100 years old? Less, a little less than 100 years old. 1928. I forgot which year in the 20s it was. Um, so part one is in camp. Why eat? Chapter one. Why eat? It's a very odd thing. As odd as can be that whenever Mrs. Sorry, it's a very odd thing, as odd as can be, that whatever Miss T eats turns into Miss T. Porridge and apples, mince muffins and mutton, jam junket jumbles, not a wrap, not a button. It matters the moment they're out of her plate, though shared by Miss Butcher and sour Miss Bait, or sour Mr. Bait, tiny and cheerful and neat as can be, whatever Miss T eats turns into Miss T. Walter de la Mer. Uh, from Peacock Pie by Walter de la Mer, by the kind permission of Henry Holt and Company. <laughs> Interesting. Foods and their sources. Oh, I like this part. Um, so foods and their sources. Protein has the triple function of supplying energy to the body, of making possible the growth of new material, and of repairing worn out tissues. Fat is an excellent source of energy, which because of the peculiarities of its digestion is released slowly. 
It is there found therefore in foods rich in fat. Uh, it is found therefore that foods rich in fat satisfy the appetite for a longer period than those which digest more rapidly. Carbohydrates are of two types, starches and sugars. The sugars undergo practically no change in digestion be before being absorbed by the body and therefore release energy more quickly than any other food material. The practical value of this characteristic to the camper will be noted later. Um, water does not supply energy to the body, but it aids in the regulation of internal processes. Food materials held in solution are carried more readily to the tissues for assimilation. Waste products are carried off by water, and it also affects body temperature. Minerals, or ash constitu uh, constituents, control the neutrality of the blood, the regularity of the heartbeat, and the tone of the nerves and muscles. Certain ones, such as calcium, play an important part in the formation of bone. Vitamins were unknown substances a few years ago, and even now there is a certain amount of mystery about them. We have some definite knowledge of them, however, and it's important that everyone should be aware of it. It is interesting, too, to know how this information was gained. Through experimentation on animals of rapid growth, such as rats and guinea pigs, which show in an astonishingly short time the good or bad effects of different diets, much has been learned that is of value to human health. The three substances which have been isolated and studied with the most success are called vitamins A, B, and C. It is found that when the experimental animals were deprived of certain foods, striking effects were produced similar to those which have been observed in human beings. These effects were classed as deficiency diseases. It was discovered that in less extreme cases, when the actual disease was not produced, there was a marked effect on the general growth the bone development, and the reproductive power of the animals. When it was possible to connect a definite disease with a specific vitamin, these conclusions were reached. Absence of vitamin A produces eye disease. Absence of vitamin B results in the, a form of paralysis. Absence of vitamin C causes the development of scurvy. I find that really rather interesting because that is more analytical and frankly accurate than the food pyramid that was put out by the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, years later. Um, so ash constituents, minerals or ash constituents definitely is an interesting way to categorize it, but the description that they provide is more or less accurate. I mean, some of this isn't fully accurate because there's been more science, there's been developments, but the analysis they provide is more useful in analyzing what you're going to do and why you're eating certain things than the USDA food pyramid was. Yes, noticeably absent from the sources of vitamins list, Klim. And then they're teaching about food and budgeting for a well-balanced diet, food and the pocketbook, calculation of calories. This 100-year-old Girl Scout uh, camping cookbook seems better than most diet books that I have seen. Wow. Digestion in the camp menu. Aids to the digestion are regular meal times, stimulation of the digestive juices by chewing of hard or crisp foods, smelling food, tasting highly flavored foods, stimulation of muscular activity of the intestines by the use of bulky rather than refined foods, the use of plenty of water as a stimulant and cleanser, psychological aid, looking at attractively colored or prettily arranged foods. Hindrances to digestion are overfatigue of the, of the body, overstrain of the mind and nervous system, irregular meal times and eating between meals, irritation of the digestive tract by the use of too many concentrated foods or of an excess of any one type of food. Interesting. <clears throat> I'm looking to see if we can get to some actual recipes or 
cooking methods. Some menus. Lamb stew with potatoes and onions. Stewed prunes. Oh, and we have recipes. About 15 or so minutes left. Camp bread, nut bread, bran muffins, sweet muffins, cornmeal pancakes, Irish bread, peanut butter loaf, rolled meat loaf, <clears throat> scotch soup. One number 10 can of tomatoes, one and a half cups of raw oatmeal, two quarts water boiling, salt and pepper, onion if desired, add the oatmeal slowly to the boiling water. When thickened, add the tomato and mix well. Cook until the oatmeal is thoroughly tender. That, to me, sounds revolting. The idea of tomatoes and oatmeal together sounds horrible. I cannot imagine what that would actually taste like. Bannock, steamed pudding, steamed chocolate pudding, various drop cakes, applesauce cake, pulled molasses candy. Wait, pulled? They have a section on candy in here. I guess this is not strictly a um, camping cookbook. It's called Kettles and Campfires because it's Girl Scouts, but it's a general cookbook. Interesting, tomatoes and oats are both common ingredients in meatloaf. I was not aware of this. I've never made a meatloaf myself. <laughs> I generally bake. I don't really do cooking, and so I don't end up doing a lot of meat-related things. Um, Interesting. I, I'm just flipping through here. They've got some stuff on equipment for cooking. Equipment for camping. Some tent stuff. So having never been involved with the Girl Scouts, before and having no sisters. This is my first real look at any like um, Girl Scout type stuff and it seems similar in some ways to Boy Scout stuff but also they have better recipes than would ever be given to the Boy Scouts. <laughs> Anyway, that one's pretty cool. I, I will keep that one in mind because if we want to, we can always come back to it. But I want to I want to try and get through um, the Grub Steak Cookbook and the Boy Scout Cookbook in the next few minutes here, or at least not necessarily get through them, but take a look at them. This one is from 1934. It's Sunset's Grub Steak Cookbook: Camping, Hunting, Fishing, Barbecuing. First one that we've had that's actually mentioned the word barbecuing. And it has color on the cover. It's black and white except for the campfire. The campfire in the illustration here is red. This is a tiny dot. It's also got a hole punch in it where you would have put like a string or something through it, um, which makes it me feel like it was either taken camping or intended for camping. I don't know if the hole is original or was added later. Copyright 1934. Forward. Not all of us can afford to hire guides to do our cooking and packing and put salt on the deer's tail. 
Neither can we turn our problems over to professional outfitters who supply costly equipment and plan and organize for us. Nor can we all trek to the four corners of the earth. Personally, half the kick in camping is doing my own planning, outfitting, packing, and cooking. My, my way may not jibe with your way. Honest differences are as numerous as the leaves in the forest. This book has been written from the past experience and bull sessions over the campfire, hunting, fishing, cooking, prospecting, and just rambling. Sure hope you like it. Correspondence on cooking camp craft and the wide open spaces is invited. Let's swap facts, experiences, and incidences. Enclosed self-addressed stamp, etc. Camps and transportation. Listing camp equipment is somewhat useless outside of generalizing and suggesting. Each trip must be planned individually since the purpose of the trip and personalities vary greatly. Cooking and provisions. E each meal should consist of proteins, minerals, vitamins, carbohydrates, digestible fats, roughage, and water. Grub rations four men, for four men on two weeks trip gives you actual like measurements of how much stuff you should take. Oh, oh no. We're referring to uh, the Hudson Bay Company and the US Army traveling ration now. I thought it was going to be product placement, but I guess it's just looking at a common measure that would have been used. Camp provisions, camp utensils. Camp fires. The trick in cooking over campfires is knowing how, understanding essentials, taking advantage of every situation, building the right kind of fire for your particular camp, and last but not least, being orderly and clean. The purpose here is not to lay down rules, but to present methods to ponder over. Fuel is easily explained. Gather the best. Whether dung or wood, wood fires are very hot and require constant pot watching with frequent stirring or basting to prevent scorching. A bad feature of wood is that it burns down quickly, thus to keep a comparatively even temperature under the kettle, more feeding of fire is required. Don't pile it on, but add a few solid chunks from time to time so it won't create a scorching blaze. Always have a supply handy to stoke as needed. Never cook over large flaming fires. Glowing coals are wanted. Besides, you'll need to hover over it without a ten-foot pole. Carefully tuck away some dry kindling for rainy days, but when you'll need to be at your best to turn out a meal. Have plenty of matches cached away in watertight boxes in several different places. You may drop your matches in the river. So, uh, axe, good fire combination, fire irons, trench fireplace, skillet reflector, Interesting. Oil drum camp stove. We've seen that illustration of a folding reflector before. Not that exact one, but that general shape. Log range, fire crane, a rock fireplace. Like you have to be in a really permanent place This is literally the opposite of camp cooking. I'm guessing that note, Simsilica, is actually a little while that I that's been there and I missed it. Um, a gas stove illustrated here in a book from 1934. That looks really, really similar to the gas, the propane camp stoves that I'm used to seeing from like the 80s. Skillet with folding handle. Talking about methods of cooking, marinating, greasing, etc. Stews, steaks. Camper's pie, gravies, sauces, stuffings. 
and stuff. So really similar to some of the other camping books that we've looked at. I want to pull out the Boy Scout one real quick. And we'll look at that one. And it'll be the last one that we look at today. We have Klim pamphlets in the pamphlet collection. I'll have to see if I can grab them for next week. That would be fun to, to show them, because they would be very visual, whereas this was a less visual thing. So here is the Boy Scout one, a manual of cooking. Uh, we don't have an exact date on this. Written inside is 1940s, question mark. Um, copyright by the Home Economics Department, Kellogg Company, Battle Creek, Michigan. For Boy Scouts. So it's a manual of cooking for Boy Scouts, but it is copyright Kellogg's. Whereas the Girl Scouts one, they had their own copyright on their book. The Boy Scouts one is from Kellogg's. Yeah, Battle Creek. <laughs> Food! Oh boy! What a word! It strikes deep in the heart, oh, er, uh, thereabouts, of every scout. A fellow who can't cook isn't much of a scout. A fellow who doesn't learn to cook is missing a lot of fun. But more than that, he just isn't educated. Who ever heard about camping without eating? And who ever heard about scouting without camping? So there you are! Now how can a fellow become a good scout cook? Well in the old days I suppose it was by trial and error. But not now, no siree! Now you just have to know how to read and of course put a little practice over an open fire. You just take a good book on cooking, like this one, and follow directions. You hold the book in one hand and stir with the other. Or prop it up on a rock and use both hands. Of course, you use your head a little too. And that means using the book at least until you can cook by ear. Hearsay, memory, or inspiration. Good luck to you, Scout, in your future triumphs over the glowing coals of a cooking fire out in the open where all good Scouts belong. Wes H. Klusman. National Director of Camping and Activities, Boy Scouts of America. <laughs> Is it from 1949, Fluidon? How did you find that? Because it doesn't have a, a date actually in the book. A coach in one of the large universities once said that you could always pick out the freshman boys who had been Boy Scouts. They were the boys with initiative, assurance, and a general know-how. It's on Amazon. <laughs> of course it's on Amazon. The training you are receiving now as a Boy Scout will stand you in good stead for the rest of your life. Whatever the future holds, is in, er, holds in store for you. Part of that training is planning and pre 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 is the planning and preparation of food for campfire cooking. So find what provisions will be available near the campsite, plan your menus, Make lists of food. For a patrol of eight boys, the equipment needed is water bucket, set salt and paper sh shakers, eight or nine plates, eight knives, one large frying pan, three kettles, one large kitchen knife, one large spoon, one sharp scout axe or sheath knife, two dish towels, and paper napkins. Oh, here we go, and add. Kelbull Pack. Another Kellogg first. Not only are Kellogg's cereals available in the convenient individual package, but also in the now famous Kelbull Pack. Use them wherever and whenever it is advantageous to eliminate the conventional cereal bowl. To cut down dish breakage to reduce dish washing labor, Kelbull Pack products are avail uh, available are Kellogg's Corn Flakes, Pep, Rice Krispies, Kellogg's 40% Bran Flakes, and Kellogg's Rice Flakes. So, 1980s. 
Oh, Lord Portico, have a good meeting. We'll be signing off very shortly, but uh, we got an ad for cornflakes. Um, and what is amazing to me is this package, they weren't called Kel Bowl Packs, uh, but we used to take these with us on Boy Scout scouting trips in the 80s. And they're advertised in this 1949 book that is ostensibly for the Boy Scouts, but is published and copywritten by the Kellogg's company. So I'm not surprised to find an ad. Pep was the sponsor for the Superman radio show. I did not know that. Suggestions for meals on the trail. Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Kellogg's 40% Bran Flakes. Kellogg's Crumbles. Kellogg's Pep. Kellogg's Shredded Wheat. Kellogg's 40% Bran Flakes. I mean, there are other things on here, but uh, they definitely think you should be having Kellogg's cereal every morning for breakfast. Uh, pancakes, all bran muffins, all bran pancakes, Irish stew, campfire stew, rice and cheese, scrambled eggs, baked eggs, hush puppies, coconut macaroons, interesting spelling of coconut, rice crispy brittle, Rice Krispie Brittle, again, two different recipes for that. Cornflake chews. All bran fudge squares. <laughs> so your desserts are made mostly of Kellogg's cereal. Orange Aid Cocoa Nose Bag Lunches. Although it is much more fun to pitch camp at mealtime and cook the food to be eaten, when this is not possible, the scout can carry a nose bag lunch, which requires no last minute preparation. Ham sandwiches on whole wheat bread, hard cooked egg, cookies, fresh fruit. So basically just a cold lunch. <laughs> Must be after J.H. Kellogg was no longer controlling things vocally vegetarian. Um, yeah, Kira could tell you for sure the dates, but yeah, this was, if this was 1949, that I believe is well after um, the Kellogg of Kellogg's was no longer part, uh, or at least in control. We do have some um, blog posts about Kellogg's stuff on the food history blog, I, I think. Um, again, Kira would be the one to know, but uh, I don't have those links at hand to just drop them in the chat, but um, it's fascinating and somewhat disturbing history when you read about the Kellogg family. <laughs> yeah, he died in 1943. <laughs> so that would certainly uh, cut into his ability to affect the cookbooks. <laughs> <clears throat> to attain a merit badge for cooking, a scout must build a fireplace out of stone, brick, clay, logs, or other locally gathered material. Build a fire in the fireplace. Give evidence satisfactory to the counselor that he has cooked over this fire a satisfactory meal for at least four persons, including hot soup, meat or fish, two fresh vegetables, a dessert which requires cooking, uh, and a hot beverage, timing his cooking so that the courses will be ready to serve at the proper time. Order and pack properly for transportation the necessary materials to make this meal. Uh, mix dough and bake biscuits or other bread for four or more persons outdoors in a reflector oven, clay or Dutch oven, or any other improvised outdoor oven. Uh, give evidence that he has ca carved properly and served correctly to a patrol or family group at a table. And then you have pictured the various cereals that have been mentioned, including shredded wheat, crumbles, all bran, uh, raisin bran, 40% bran flakes, pep, corn flakes, and rice krispies. And thank you, Kira, for dropping the link to the Kellogg blog posts if you're curious about the history of the Kellogg's. And oh boy, is it um, interesting. <laughs> uh, you can find out more there. Um, 
that is the last one that we're going to look at today. Um, so everything so far has all been camp-related, camping-related, um, which sort of forms the basis for uh, the, the basis for what will become the tradition of backyard grilling in America and eventually the tradition of tailgating in America um, kind of has its foundation, at least cu cuisine-wise, um, its foundation here in uh, these sort of manuals for outdoor camp cooking, the types of foods that you would cook uh, on a camp out, um, the methods for cooking on a camp out will eventually translate into that. And next week we will be diving in. I think the next one that we've got is from, um, well, I'm not sure what date it's from because it's undated, but it, it, the next ones that we're looking at are going to pu pull us into that post-war period when people start having um, backyards in suburbia and socializing through grilling and inviting families over for a backyard cookout. Uh, so we'll start getting into those cookbooks next week at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time um, here on uh, VTUL, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios or twitch.tv slash Rogan27. And hopefully you will come back and join me for that exploration. Um, we are going to do a raid and let me just see. I think... Do, 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 do. So uh, we are going to head on over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have the sea otter cam up today, so we will be heading over there um, and uh, enjoying a little bit of time with the sea otters at the aquarium. Uh, thank you all again for coming. Thanks to my mods. Um, and I hope I get to see you all again next week. Um, until then, uh, have fun in the archives. <laughs>